Today we have Professor Karl Feininger from the University of Graz as a presenter. Uh, I would just like to briefly introduce him. So Professor Steininger is a professor of climate economics and sustainable transition at the University of Graz. His main research areas are the economic impact of climate change and the low long-term um, transition to a low-carbon economy and the necessary adjustments for uh, areas like spatial, spatial planning, industrial production, or energy supply. His expertise is very well acknowledged among his peers, which you can see from the fact that he is currently serving as the president of the Austrian Economic Association, and he also is the chair of the monitoring group for the Paris Agreement. I say this all basically for the non-Austrians among you, because uh, Professor Steininger doesn't need an introduction to Austria. Professor Steininger actually is the public face and voice of climate economics in Austria. And I think this is especially the case because he uh, fulfilled something which is called the third mission of universities, which is he really takes part in public debates. And he also enables uh, the transfer of academic knowledge to help to resolve important challenges in our societies. I think it is worth to stress this fact because not many professors do this, and I would also like to thank Professor Steininger for his service in this respect. So, uh, Professor Steininger, I would like you to uh, start with the presentation. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks a lot also for devoting the summer school to an issue that is increasingly um, challenging us in the future and already currently and thanks for the uh, excellent discussions and presentations we already had. I plan uh, to do it in two parts with a break in between and really invite you all to phrase any considerations, questions, reflections. My plan is to start with the challenge of the climate crisis. How is it different? Why is it so substantial? Some uh, physical basics. And then, similar to the um, structure that Sandra Patton had chosen, um, I want to focus on two things, on physical hazards, number two here, and on the transformative hazards. And for both, look at what does it imply for economic consequences and for the financial system. And I'm so thankful for the central bank and the banking system in general to pick up this issue because especially for the transformative hazards, we are dependent on adequate framework conditions also on, on, on the financial side to really properly uh, manage those hazards and to really achieve our transform, trend, transformation. On the physical hazards, it's more close, it's closer probably to what national banks and central banks would be focusing on anyway because they want to avoid or want to uh, accompany um, any disruptions in the, in the economy. So on physical hazards, I will show you how a coupling of modeling could help, especially to devote more focus on spatial and sectoral detail, to discuss current damages you already observe, to discuss known trends in the economic sphere, but also to have an eye on the known unknowns. And then for transformative hazards, on our way to carbon neutrality, I would like to start out with the areas of political action and focus in particular on the European Union, their plan for a clean planet for all, and the Green Deal that is derived from that, but then go to the transform transformation pathways and what are the macroeconomic consequences. I will deal with what do different macro modeling approaches tell us, how can we co-create uh, knowledge with the agents so that we really also from the scientific side focus on the risks that stakeholders see, and finally close with the relevance of the financial framework for this transformation pathway. Um, as you, I think, practiced in the last session, sessions yesterday and the, since Monday, please 
raise any understanding questions in between in the chat and I will be uh, pointed and uh, Wolfgang and Andreas will point out that to me and otherwise happy to really discuss also afterwards. So the challenge of the climate crisis, what makes this so different? Um, if you look at the greenhouse gases over the last thousand years, so from year 1000 to 2000, we see that the most important ones increased dramatically in the last century, one and a half century space and basically. Well, is this a trouble? If we look back from today, 400,000 years past, we see that CO2 also fluctuated here. But these fluctuations we have in a range of 200 to 300 yeah, parts per million. And if we take this range of historic fluctuations over the last 400,000 years to the left hand side, to the last 1,000 years, we see that we broke out of this range around 1900 and now have uh, much higher concentrations in the atmosphere. The same is true for the right axis from 400 to 800 ppm. And also there, we exceeded this range in our Earth history now in the, around the year 1900. And are currently at double uh, the concentration levels than we had in the last 400,000 years. For different reasons, but due to the basic physical uh, equation, temperature fluctuates with greenhouse gases. And the question now is, uh, if we increase greenhouse gases further, uh, we are doing an uncontrolled experiment. We have never been there on our planet as long in the time frame that the human beings are around and what will happen. So the last 10,000 years, our, the last 100,000 years here um, for migration out of modern, modern humans out of Africa, uh, the beginning of uh, settlement, agriculture, and then we have the great European civilizations at the end. But we see that the last 10,000 years, our civilization period, the whole thing, has, has, has had a very stable climate. So all our infrastructure has been um, appropriate, has been designed to be appropriate for that climate. And on, on the regional scale, impacts are much bigger, of course, than on the global average. In the last 40 years, for example, um, we had in the summer a temperature increase of more than three, three degrees in Eastern Syria here to pick one example, whereas in Austria we had on the uh, average but for the last 200 years two degrees and globally just one degree. Or another extreme event, heat. Here we see um, the Temperatures June to August from Switzerland over the last 150 years. Most of the summers had something like 17 degrees. The coldest one was 99, almost on 1947. And then came 2003, completely different temp temperature here. It never uh, occurred in the recent past. And if the trend continues with temperature, then what was an upward bias in 2003 might be a lower bound and a downward bias some 50, 50 years later. So some of these experiences we have already made, but they of course will occur in much higher frequency. Sea level rise, a matter of more than 100 years, a few decades, uh, a few centuries. If Greenland ice that already has begun to melt, completely melts, there will be seven meters of average uh, green uh, global mean sea level rise. The Antarctic ice sheet, 58 meters and five meters of that are in the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is considered particularly vulnerable. Um, a concept that helps us also in the transformation path is the concept of the carbon budget. If we know if we want to achieve the Paris Agreement, not more than two degrees, well below two degrees, or not more than 1.5 degrees of warming. We know how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and in particular the CO2, for that it works best because it's long, longest lived in the atmosphere, we can still emit to the atmosphere. And to reach the 1.5 degree target at 50% likelihood, this is 580 gigatons of CO2. If you want to increase the likelihood, 
uh, we have to remain even on the safer side. And we could allocate this global budget to particular countries. So this is uh, just, I will sometimes go quicker over the slides, but you have them afterwards to really look up um, the detailed references. This is the recent quantifications of this global budget that we can um, then either allocate on an equal per capita basis, all the currently living people get the same amount of it, and where the countries they reside in, these budget, budget budgets are allocated to. Or we could say no, Austria has nine uh, pounds per capita CO2 equivalent per year, but we produce a lot of steel and that steel gets exported other, afterwards to Germany, to the car industry, etc. So we are not responsible for all of that. So we should just uh, define a point in time in the future, let's say 2050, where all of our countries convert to the same per capita emission. And the area underneath here is the Austrian uh, carbon budget, and the area underneath the green line here, which is uh, Burundi, that can increase from 0.3 to 1, is the carbon budget for Burundi. Well, one may say this is unfair, but this is the second version of how to um, allocate emissions, and actually within the European Union, we're doing it that way. On a global level, this might be necessary to be modified to allow people with, or to allow countries with a high amount of poverty, a low human development index, to get more emission rights at least, that at least they can sell, or to account for historical emissions that some countries have already used up their budget. And third, from benefits that we still enjoy from the infrastructure that was produced in the past while creating emissions. And there's a, a recent paper here where we have just equal per capita allocation versus accounting for these qualifications to look at global, at the needs per country, at historic emissions, at benefits inherited. And on the right hand side, you see when the budget would have been completed already, either in the future, blue, or in the past, um, in the reddish tones. So we see that if we account for historic emissions, then the US and Canada have already used up the budget in the past, similar as Australia. Well, even two degrees have a significant impact. There's a lot of uh, tipping points, West Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice, etc., that might or with certainty will uh, tip. Coral reefs are already under danger. So we have here this temperature will last 20,000 years, and the question now is whether we will remain within 1.5 or 2, 2 degrees or even go higher and run the risks of significantly more tipping points. There are some local tipping points. I, in the interest of time, I will switch over, but just to let you know that the glaciers in the Alps already have passed their tipping point, so they are melting. They will disappear probably within this century already, and that has economic implications on shipping because it's accommodating in the summer especially, but also hydropower here. Um, seasonal runoff is quite substantial for quite some rivers. And then maybe get the shipping pace on the Rhine will increase, which is already 0.4% of German industrial production, which we know from the past that will uh, decline. Drought and heat waves, we clearly know that there's an exponential relationship between temperature and evapotranspiration and that will increase uh, the hazards of wildfires as we experience them already in California, Australia, um, some parts also in Europe, in the northern Europe, Sweden, um, and like, 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 likely we decided this will increase and may uh, also be connected to significant blackouts. So I'll jump over the current budget here. Well, not quite. Let's do this. Um, the European Commission is currently discussing whether it should adjust its 2030 targets. So here is the historic emissions of the EU 27. Here is our estimate 10% minus in the year 2020 because of corona. 
and the European Commission is currently discussing a proposal of the Commission itself and the Parliament. Parliament has 65% reduction, Commission says 50 to 55% reduction, and then carbon neutrality by 2050. This would mean to need that whole amount of carbon budget, an equally distributed budget per capita from the globally available budget to well below two degrees would be smaller. So we would need more reduction, assuming here a linear uh, transformation pathway. So 55% reduction is the least we would need to do if we want to have our fair share in contribution of well below two degrees. And the second figure is 1.5 degrees, which makes the budget even smaller. So corona observations, maybe I just point out this one here. On the day of the largest lockdown, the largest area globally in lockdown, it was April 7th. Uh, about 89% of global emissions usually coming from these areas together, and it's, the emissions were down 17%. So we see that even so, hardly any air transport happened, lots of transport reductions, production reductions. Uh, the decline was not stronger than 17%, meaning that inherently in our structure in energy production, we have a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that even such strict behavioral changes do not change immediately, but it has to be a transformation of the infrastructure in general and of our economic system to really turn to carbon neutrality. Past crisis here in Austria, for example, and the same is true for all the other past crises globally had meant decline in CO2 emissions, but only temporarily afterwards, it was quickly up at the same level as it was before, at the same trend level at least. So physical hazards. Um, in our case, it was the finance ministry interested, what will the budget be burdened by what amounts in uh, the future because of climate change? And I'd like to show you one study here we did um, combining various detailed sectoral models in one macroeconomic model and what conclusions we could get out of that. So what are the critical issues in this impact evaluation? From the natural sciences, we know the climate sensitivity that's stable for more than two decades now. We also know robust temperature scenarios. They are quite diverse on the regional level. So some uh, models, precipitation goes up, for others it goes down in some regions. But still, we can learn for precautionary adaptation, and we learn also that, mod, that uh, mitigation is highly necessary. In socioeconomics, there were discussions in evaluation of the discount rate, which one to use, prescriptive or descriptive. Uh, the time horizon we should take into account. North has just had 100 years, Stern took more than 200 years. And then the tipping points discussion, whether we should look at the fat tails or what would the, how would the results differ if we look at fat tails, persistent uncertainty, and the damage functions of the general in the integrated assessment models that you discussed with Kayan on Monday, they received quite substantial critique from people like Bob Pindyke, for example, because they are somewhat arbitrary and they neglect catastrophic risks. We know of direct cost, cost in the sector, and indirect costs upstream and downstream. Indirect direct costs may be a manifold of direct costs. Um, for actual uh, national quantification, there is mainly dynamic input output modeling that mostly was uh, applied on event based basis. There is disaster risk management analysis where also the fiscal vulnerability has been analyzed. And there is various macroeconomic uh, models in the tradition of, for example, computer to general equilibrium, where you really see this cross-sectoral impacts. And what I will show you here in, the, in some five to 10 minutes, um, our evaluation for the example of Austria, where we had a bottom-up physical approach, we monetized these impacts, and then, um, see how they uh, apply and 
across a much broader set of impact fields that had been available before, also into a consistent framework, a macroeconomic framework and welfare and, and, and analysis. So, yeah. So we had basically 12 fields of impact, all the impacts that are con uh, contended in the Austrian uh, climate adaptation strategy and 18 research institutions con contributing to it to really have good coverage from agriculture to via tourism to natural catastrophes, for forestry, etc. And conceptually, we already observe weather and climate related damages in the past. And even without climate change, just the socioeconomic change might increase those. For example, um, that the share of the elderly in the population will increase. And that means even if the heat waves remain at the same frequency, damages will increase. And then we have additional climate change um, because we continue to emit greenhouse gases and are not yet at climate neutrality. So what we did basically was scenarios of climate change. We had one global scenario, but different uh, representations, different mat materializations at the local level of ways that had a low, in, low impact and high impact. And similarly with socioeconomic uh, parameters for the heat impact and health impact and enhancing socioeconomic development would be a higher share of elderly and those elderly being poorer, not affording air conditioning, for example. So what we did is we really looked at what impacts are there from climate change, what are their future costs, and then map them into the economic variables and quantify their, quantify their macroeconomic effects. So for example, precipitation, flood events, uh, challenge the natural disaster fund and its, well, its financial uh, appropriateness. Um, it's also disaster relief forces, it's volunteers that are called for, etc. And then we gave which ones were already available for quantification. Only the first one was, the other ones, there was no quantitative models yet. So we, in total of the 80 impact chains, we quantified 37 here. For example, for human health, currently we had an annual death toll on a that average of 750 due to heat waves. And this is increasing depending on the socioeconomic development, but also depending on the climate scenario, how it materializes on the local scale. And this could even be up to three, well, 3,000, um, which is nine, eightfold here. And then how to cost this. There's various costing methods, change in final demand, change in productivity, change in production costs, replacement cost approach, and preventative expenditure. And these could be applied in the respective chains and um, the costing units. How did we do it? Um, let's see. Okay, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, here is a short specification of the CGE model. Austria is a region, region, regional entity, base year 2008, international trade, small open economy, earning consumption for the sectors, nested test functions, and final demand by households and government. Um, so the model closure, I think you discussed that on Monday already. In our case, we have a fixed given Aggregate investment and additional investment induced by climate change impacts is redirected from other investment, similar with the government balance. When government pays more on climate adjustment, it can expand less on other tests to reduce its expenditure on other uh, services it supplies. Hello. Yeah, here we see uh, all the sectors, agriculture, forestry, etc., and both of the approaches are relevant. 
So for agriculture, it was production costs, more irrigation, for example, change in productivity because of the longer uh, growing period, actually productivity is increasing and public expenditure, uh, some of the adaptation is paid by the public. So let's shift to the results. Additional climate change in, on GDP and on welfare for two time horizons, a 30-year period around 2030, a 30-year period around 2050. And you see the various sectors here in terms of welfare, strongest effects are for catastrophe management, so flooding basically. And that only shows up in welfare because it doesn't show up in GDP. And GDP doesn't show up because first you're damaged, but then you go out and buy your new furniture again that has, has been damaged to the GDP is made up again. There's some, some small loss, of course, because uh, production is lost. But in welfare, we really lose because we have otherwise have been able to use those funds for welfare enhancing activities. The addiction equivalent here and the variation that we used here. So, what's more interesting may be uh, the extremes. So, these are the results, um, the 1 billion we currently have, 1 to 1.6 billion from socio-demographic changes and 2.2 to 2.6 billion from uh, climate change per year in mid-century. But um, we also did not only give this medium scenarios, but I showed you this matrix earlier. We also went to the extreme ends of lowest and, 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 and higher damages, and here we see that damages uh, can rise in the scenarios here, right here, up to 9 billion, for example, for okay. um, It's important to state what has not been quantified here are all, or some of them, some of the impact chains not quantified, or I think all of them not quantified in their respective sectors. So we clearly have to acknowledge there is more to happen. Um, maybe on the positive end, we had some positive impacts in, such as uh, expanding, expanding the uh, uh, growing period, but most of the impacts were negative and the net effect was clearly negative. Concluding with Weizmann, um, perhaps in the end, the climate change economists can help most by not presenting a cost-benefit estimate for what is inherently a fat tail situation with potentially unlimited downside exposure, as if it is accurate and objective. But instead, by stressing somewhat more openly the fact that such an estimate might considerably be arbitrarily inaccurate depending on what is subjectively assumed about the high temperature damage function, along with assumptions about the fatness of the tails. Even just acknowledging more openly the incredible magnitude of the deep structural uncertainties might go a long way to ele elevating the level of public discourse. So it's clear that those fat tails, those extreme events, are uh, the core issue in climate change, as climate change is a risk management issue. And those extreme events, we then also analyze for agriculture. Um, that droughts could quickly, completely make up uh, the productivity gains for human health. Events with 5% likelihood would more than double the death tolls, and for riverine flooding, by the end of the century, a 5% or 1% uh, tail uh, raises the damages just to buildings up to even 48 to 40 billion, for example. So tremendously stronger damages here that uh, are necessary in both the insurance uh, sector, but also in the sector of um, asset management to really acknowledge um, those potential damages as well for a portfolio, for an adequate portfolio mix. So, indirect effects can be multiple in our analysis. They turned up to be up to fourfold. Public budget analysis requires feedback implications. 
um, analysis reveals damage hotspots which sectors in Austria it's flooding especially but also agriculture forestry and where socioeconomic development determine damages in flooding for example you can really restrict housing the zoning basically and really strongly reduce damages known unknowns um, at least we might want to uh, figure out what are the ranges and extreme events are here most relevant and the assessment is limited by data availability we depend on these studies and the multi that build up process. If you want to take a closer look, it came out as a book with Springer. There's an article on it, a short version, a condensed version in climate services. There is also uh, on our coin page, in both English and German, uh, fact sheets for the various sectors that have been derived. So this is one of these engagements with the public to really make our results accessible also. And stories here, three pages for each of the impact fields. How did it happen in the past? But it need not to be that strong in the future. We still can manage by better adaptation, but also by, of course, mitigation. And these are the 18 institutions that worked to this particular project. Okay, um, having both the physical hazards covered now quickly, and maybe you have questions. We have definitely time for questions now, but I would otherwise then um, after the Q&A session for the first part make a short break and then continue with uh, the transformative hazards in my second. Uh, so we have one question from Andreas actually, but then we, I think we can start the break. I just wanted to know what type of data you use for, for all these type of damage functions and so on. Uh, is it um, meteorological? Uh, data or is it, is it insurance data? What, what type of data do we use? Mm -hmm. So here we really have for each of these 12 fields, we have sectoral physical models. For example, for agriculture, uh, it was the University of Agricultural Sciences that has a farm level model where they have um, the farmers optimizing their particular parcel depending on the quality of the soil at the particular uh, location. And we insert to these models uh, climate scenarios for the future, the whole range, and then look at what would be the most significant changes in both directions, positive, expanding the uh, growing season and negative increasing extreme events. And then the farmers, uh, as assumed in the model, can adjust the culture, the crop they are growing there. Um, so it is really a combination of very different models. And then we have to define the interface as well that um, we still have a consistent overall approach. So we use the same climate scenarios, for example, and don't add an agricultural scenario with a drought, with a flooding scenario which had extreme rain, rainfall, for example. So we had to make clear that all across those 18 uh, research groups, they were clear which uh, scenarios to use and which ones we could at the end combine in a single macroeconomic model. And the link between those models to the macroeconomic model was this one larger matrix that I showed that having all the sectors uh, top down and having the various ways uh, of uh, macroeconom of, e of e economic model in integration on the horizontal axis. Okay, um, so I'll suggest that we resume at nine. Which gives us a full nine minute break. And uh, so enjoy your coffee and then see you later. Uh, welcome back, and I think we can now resume with the presentation. Professor Schreiner, please. Thanks a lot. Welcome back from the break. So I come now to the second part to the transformative hazards. The first thing I want to deal with is what are the areas of political action? And for that, especially in Europe, 
I would suggest and like I uh, really esteem a lot uh, this document from November 2018 of the old commission, a clean planet for all that clearly summarizes what we basically know, but uh, in a very also economic oriented way in the sense of where do we need the innovations. And these are the seven fields, energy efficiency, including zero emission buildings, renewables, clean mobility, competitive EU industry and especially circular economy, smart network infrastructure, bioeconomy, carbon capture and storage. These are basically uh, the seven strategies that we need to deal with. And the European Union last December has um, worked on that further and turned it into a political uh, package, the Green Deal, which is basically based on this November 2018 document. And on a global level, um, we do currently are on a trajectory which would mean that we would hit the 1.5 degree target globally, or the 1.5, not, not the target, but the 1.5 increase in temperature by 2040. But there is scenarios to really limit uh, the rise of temperature. This is the IPCC 1.5 degree report in this range. Uh, with two thirds below uh, 1.5 degrees, or even stricter, with a higher likelihood. This is the um, blue one here, or just with a 50% chance, which is the pur purple one. How do these translate into emission development? CO2 emissions would for the standard case need to come to zero around 2055 globally and meaning that the concentration in the atmosphere is stabilized, cum cum cumulative emissions. Um, if we want to go for a high likelihood of the 1.5 degree targets, we want to have to reduce by 2040, such as not well, as global average, but as the Austrian government has proposed in its last, last government uh, uh, agreement. And it could also go the other way if non-CO2 gases are not declining after 2030, but staying at the same time then the chance of meeting 1.5 degree will be just 50% and not as high as in the other cases. What does such an emission reduction mean? How can these efforts be across countries and across economic sectors. That might be interesting to see for the country outlooks uh, what challenges are there also on the mitigation side and for economic sectors, how long will their infrastructure still, can it be used until the end of its use time or is the transition more expensive because we have to substitute infrastructure earlier. And one issue currently discussed in the European Union is increasing uh, the 2030 targets. Currently, from 2018, there is the target of 40% reduction by 2030 and split across EU member countries accordingly. And the Green Deal proposes 50 to 55% reduction from 2030 relative to 2005. No relative to 1990. And this means also that country targets would need to be adjusted. How can we do that? Um, just to give an overview of what kind of emissions we have. Here is all greenhouse gas emissions. Part of it, that's, this is now the uh, emission timeline for the case of Austria as a EU member country. Part of it is in the emission trading system, the big industry, steel, uh, energy production, chemicals, etc. Then there is the land use and land use change and forestry sector in Austria that's uh, a sink net. There's also international transport and the rest is basically covered uh, or the rest each country is responsible for the non-ETS sectors or the effort sharing sectors. And this is the, 
these are the targets for these kind of emissions that we are discussing now. How quick should they go down by 2030 and ultimately they need to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest. And this is the current effort sharing regulations, reg reg regulation that was basically based on a GDP per capita uh, uh, basis. Countries that had very low GDP per capita had to do nothing, like Bulgaria, for example, and countries with the highest GDP per capita, Luxembourg and also the Netherlands are pretty high, they are doing the most. And we are currently discussing uh, here in Austria, but also at the European level, how this could be changed if the EU target is 55%. And some of the issues I talked, I told you earlier, poverty, for example, we also could apply within the European Union. If countries with a high poverty share, they might need to reduce less. Countries uh, with a high share of renewables already, they achieved something for the common good and that's spreading to the other countries. They might even be um, awarded for that. Or we could simply take an equal budget for all countries, for all people in the country, in the European Union, and this is um, allocate that. These three qualifications we used here, and then we get some distribution of reduction targets across members. So Bulgaria would have to, uh, even already in 2013, uh, increase its efforts. Austria would have to increase it to 49% four, four, with this particular case. You can play around um, with this tool. It will be available tomorrow uh, on the web under the link I have uh, placed here in forthcoming. Uh, you can see the paper and the, the tool. For Austria, those qualifications mean um, by 2030, that's the current target agreed upon in the European Union for Austria. If we use GDP per person, this is the range. <coughs> if <coughs> we qualified <coughs> with full weight, 100%, then Austria has a relatively high GDP per person, then it would need to reduce emissions much stronger. 40%, 10%, 0%. So these are always uh, the qualifications here. How strong, with which intensity we weigh this qualification. If you go for emissions, e e e equal emissions per person in 2030, there's not much change. Emission budget per person, this would reduce Austrian budget uh, emissions and therefore increase the tar tar target. For renewables, Austria has, was pretty successful, so we put in we could even lower the target and put more effort after 2013. Past emissions would really, if we include them fully, fully would strongly uh, increase the demand on Austria. So it's an issue of political discussion how much of these qualifications will be included and then how the overall reduction of the EU is allocated among the countries. And we can have a similar approach. <clears throat> we can also use this budget approach uh, to look at sectors. And here I just jump to this figure. For example, for the uh, building sector, we can look at what are the construction supply chains, the embodied emissions. And it may be that uh, cement industry, or no, let's say steel industry, they only start now with pilot projects. They will only start in 2028, for example, as constant emissions up until then. And, but then they will replace all their infrastructure up until 2040, 15 years or so, um, and then have declining emissions in the steel sector. Cement may start earlier, for example, and all the other uh, emissions connected to building somehow in the blue line here. So this would mean <clears throat> what would be the needed emissions if <clears throat> infrastructure gets only replaced at the end of its lifetime and assuming that at some point a carbon-free technology will be available. And the same is true for the use phase. Oil systems might be phased out right away. 
uh, after 15 years, they have been all phased out, for example, gas might come a little bit later, and the other ones. This way, we could collect in each sector what is the required budget, and then we can compare it to the budget that is available for the country, and usually see, we did it here um, in a paper that came out this year, we saw that for Austria it would the demanded budget would at least be double the one we have. So we really need to be quicker in getting out of uh, emissions. And <clears throat> which sectors can particularly be helpful? Here is all the sectors in Austria by their emission level in terms of um, how many. Um, how many million tons per year they had in 2018. <clears throat> Consumption-based emissions are including uh, the whole life cycle of the product, products produced there. Not life cycle, the production chain uh, up until use, basically. And um, we see that construction has a very high con contribution here, as already that's all, all, also indicated by the bubble size, which is the necessary sectoral consumption budget. But construction also has a very high share of it going to investment, being investment demand. And therefore, if we make better construction, more um, um, uh, re refinement of uh, heating systems or uh, <clears throat> um, restructuring, of, uh, of the buildings to use less energy thereafter and less emissions. So it may be okay to have high emissions in construction if they go in a way, if they go in a mood, in a type of infrastructure that uses less, um, that causes less emissions thereafter. Okay, so this was the conceptual, the first part. Uh, there is carbon budgets available, how to split them across countries what efforts do countries have to do and the cross sectors. And the second part is now how to develop together with industry those uh, transformation pathways, those low carbon tran transition. And I start with two papers, both on the steel uh, sector, steel and electricity sector, because you have to look at, you have to look at them together. The first one is on co-design in this risk analysis. Um, basically, it's the issue is one of circular economy. And what feasible transition pathways are there? You always have the link to the article here. You are, I also cite them in the reference section at the end. What are feasible transition pathways in the iron steel as well as the electricity sector, sector? And what are the potential risks there? We did co-production process with industry, policy, administration, and science to really find reliable carbon neutral pathways and identify associated risks which also included macroeconomic risks, and we quantified them. Um, yeah, what did we do? Basically, um, it was a two and a half year project, and we worked with stakeholder workshops, two stakeholder workshops, and in between with interviews, with bilateral calls, discussing first model runs with them. Um, so it was a Two and a half year interaction with uh, stakeholders from the sector of steel and electricity. We had a dynamic uh, CGE model here, recursive dynamic global multi regions, also in five year steps, based on the GTAP databases, six world regions, 15 economic sectors. And for steel, of course, we modeled it uh, uh, more in more depth. What were the results? First, we develop the transition pathway. What needs to be the case in 2050 such that, um, what needs to be the case in 2050 to have carbon neutrality? And for this to be reached, what needs to be the case in 2045? So backcasting basically in terms of technological development, in terms of the political framework, what CO2 price do we need, for example? What are the risks and uncertainties? And how can we treat which of these risks and uncertainties we can quantify with our particular model approach. So just to mention, these are the clusters of risks. Um, energy infrastructure, what's the demand? Is the grid available there? Is the system flexible enough? 
politics? Uh, is the political coordination well enough? We're currently discussing whether there will be funding in this restructuring for those pilot projects of uh, the steel or of the cement industry to foster their trans transition. On human acceptance, the environment, is it really environmentally beneficial or is it just out uh, leak, leakage, a matter of uh, then uh, the production moving abroad outside the European Union? Competition and financial markets, innovation and technological choice, how can we avoid lock-in effects or where are the synergies? What's the correct timing? And some of these um, we could specify here is um, the market price of steel and here is the output. And we have uh, different uh, uh, variations of when this transformation gets active. First, um, we can start either in 2020 or 25 actually, um, in 2020, 2026, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, but then it goes up uh, in 25 or only in uh, 2035, basically, so um, 15 years. 2025 or 2030, basically, so that uh, in 2030 it should show up. And second, there is two core cost versions, whether these technologies are relatively cheap or more expensive. That's the range uh, we know so far of. And what we see in terms of the market price um, starting earlier drives up the price much higher because CO2 prices in general in the economy will not be so high yet. So the relative uh, change is higher. Starting later, even if it, especially if it's cheap, will not really be a pricing problem. And similarly also won't be a quantity problem. But starting earlier would mean that we get experience and have a significant advantage when others come in later. Unemployment, skilled and unskilled will rise. GDP uh, will decline stronger so if we start early, but hardly visible in uh, 2050 if we have started early or slightly visible. In what are the limitations? As you discussed uh, the last days already, CG assumes optimality. And therefore, in the next paper, I'll show you we compared it with a post Keynesian model. In our case, technology policy uh, cannot activate otherwise idle resources in a post Keynesian sense. Mm -hmm. So we may overestimate economic growth. Implementation risk um, we only discuss consequential risks. Once we have this policy, what could be the risks triggered by it? Implementation risk would require a more political and socioeconomic approach. Um, we reduced the complexity of the transition path, just looked at electricity and not all the other sectors that might be relevant too. For example, now the steel industry really feels the decline in car demand. And so there is interactions that we did not cover in our analysis here. If it's relevant for other countries, we did in, in interviews with steel companies in the Netherlands, Germany and Sweden, and clearly saw that our quantitative results are similar relevant for them other countries as well, even though some technologies are different there. So just one fraction of the conclusion, those on the method, um, we showed how co-production can be useful for increasing scientific and social relevance. There's a strong demand for stakeholders. We really felt that they were loving our fora that we set up for them, this day-long workshops that they really freely could discuss without having a, um, a requirement to come up at the end with a agreed upon uh, press announcement, etc. but really fully uh, extending the group of stakeholders to other sectors might be highly relevant. And the broader analysis of implementation of risk would also uh, need to involve complementary approach, agent-based models, and other disciplines, political science, as some of them you had to discuss the last days. So now in this already indicated comparison of macroeconomic evaluation, we did the very same analysis in running in our model, the same scenarios also in the post Keynesian model, the E3ME model that uh, Emanuele introduced or mentioned at least on Monday. 
And the issue is being one that we can either go on with the baseline technology blast furnace in the steel sector or shift to process emission free technologies to versions here low cost, high cost. We introduce climate policy, either faster or slower. And that is happening in a world where there is a certain macroeconomic state. Our analysis might work best for uh, full capacity. Uh, the post Keynesian model would be much more appropriate, of course, in the uh, post corona time now immediately. So we have different states. And the, all this, again, is embedded in various options how the socioeconomic development would be. How does this look like? Um, I already discussed with baseline technology. For the macroeconomic state, we either, either have full capacity, the CHG model, our main comparison afterwards, or we have available resources, and we did that with the post Keynesian E3ME. And then we also have socioeconomic uncertainty. It could be that on the global scale, we have a very different development than what we assume here, middle, uh, middle range development. What are the results? Um, here we have welfare in the upper level, GDP in the lower level. And we have on the le left-hand side the high-cost scenario and on the right-hand side the low-cost uh, scenario. The red line always is the main scenario, the CHG result, uh, with certain main parameters of the other uh, issues. So the socioeconomic scenarios, the range could be the long-term slightly different, shortly it could be more different. So in the transition period, uh, there is quite a range of what could happen depending on what socioeconomic scenario we take. For the climate policy, this is the long-term range and the additional expansion of the short-term range. For the macroeconomic switch, in the CG model we had minus 1.5%, in the post-Keynesian model we had zero. And in the meantime, in the post Keynesian model, we even had an, an increase in GDP, even for the high cost uh, uh, policy, for the high cost technology. So we see that the choice of the macroeconomic model is decisively dependent on the macroeconomic results, obviously. And this means that we really need to also, uh, in our message, include this information on uh, which type of model we have chosen here. But at least uh, we can get the range and also tell under which conditions which of these results is the relevant one. Finally, relevance for uh, the financial framework and therefore the relevance of the financial framework for the transition. Uh, in our low carbon transition, we need to go to renewables, and renewables are capital intensive and have, most of them have very little um, variable costs, very little operating costs, but just investment costs. So there is a demand for additional capital, a strong one, and how the financing costs for this capital uh, is, what level that has, is crucially relevant also for the cost of this transformation process. The first paper I just point out because um, shifting to renewables, photovoltaics, for example, the most uh, physically most uh, relevant one, and most rich one in terms of availability, means that solar in, influx fluctuates over the day and over the year. We need to accommodate for that by demand management, but also by storage or linking various areas that have different weather patterns and therefore we have integration costs. So for the first paper I can quickly go over it. It just states that um, it depends on what the average cost of capital, high or low, the inserts in northern uh, EU, Western EU, in Austria and Eastern EU, Southern EU, and, and, and Greece. Austria and Greece we took separately because they, they have a very different electricity system. Austria very strongly renewable. Greece so far um, 
strong dependence also on fossil. And then we have the areas of the power extension of photovoltaics. And we saw that in most bottom up uh, technology comparison, but also in most macroeconomic studies, this electricity market integration costs were neglected and societal welfare effects to a large extension of wind and CP tend to be positive, but if integration costs are integrated, uh, positive welfare effects are either reduced or even turned to the negative. But that depends very much on the regional characteristics. What, are the, what is the prevailing electricity max? What is the weighted average cost of capital? What capacity factors? How much of the sunburn can really be turned into yeah, this, this one uh, kilowatt peak, how much uh, electricity can you produce it at a certain location? Um, the macroeconomic feedbacks do rise, uh, to raise generation costs because we have much higher capital demand and that raise is capital price, higher than what uh, stakeholders would have anticipated. Yeah may imply that renewables are no longer competitive and that may uh, also have a feedback on the cost uh, calculation for each project, for each technology, especially for those renewables that are linked here to integration costs such as wind and photovoltaics. Um, and taking these integration costs and taking mainly also the fact that investment in renewables is capital intensive. Well, investment is always capital intensive, but the cost structure of renewables is overly capital intensive. What can the overall framework help? Um, and here I just want to show you these figures here. Um, again, the same uh, country regions, Austria and Greece separately, and the rest of Europe Eastern, Northern, Western, and Southern Europe. And then uh, we have different uh, scenarios. One scenario is this basic average cost of capital. They are set uniform um, both for um, the run, the base run of the European Union and the expansion of the renewables. All countries, all sectors have a single cost of capital. And that's what's used in most of the macroeconomic models. And that gives you um, the light gray result. It's, it's this line here. That would be over time by 2050 the change in GDP for really expanding uh, renewables, in our case PV, photovoltaics and wind, for the different regions. So this is the light gray line here. Second, we go to our main setting, and this main setting means that we differentiate across regions and across the technology. So SF, um, here is solid fuels, PE is petrol and oil, you have it down here in the legend, gas, PV, and wind. We really get, uh, have different settings for uh, the different technologies. And if you notice this, you get uh, a difference in macroeconomic impact in this yellow area. It's a dark line that's now relevant. So just acknowledging differences in weighted average cost of capital across technologies and countries gives a very different result. And finally, we did a simulation for de-risking. That means that there is a policy framework change that now it's clear that we go to renewables and the risk is now uh, not on the renewable side, but is now on the fossil side. And we even did uh, one additional one, but that goes the other way again. Uh, so I don't uh, confuse you now with that as well. So I just show you uh, that one here the risking of renewables, if we lower the costs of renewables by an adequate 
uh, policy framework, if we lower the capital costs, then we clearly have um, a much higher, a, a much more positive impact on our traditional measures, such as GDP, which calls for both the policy, but also um, frameworks for banks for um, setting up a framework that really acknowledges and rewards um, a system transformation towards a state that we seek to reach as a national but also global com community. So what we see in terms of impacts, the economy-wide effects of the electric electricity sectors, low carbon transition, very are very sensitive to capital costs and risk assumptions. Our uniform assumption shows GDP effects when assuming standard capital cost assumptions. Main, this second dark line shows the effects when assuming regional technology specific capital cost assumptions and the yellow area in, in between the two shows the underestimation of benefits when I just use standard, standard capital cost assumptions, benefits of going to a renewable energy base. And uh, finally, the utmost area, here it's called green or gray, or, yeah, uh, shows the benefits from de-risking renewables by increasing trust. So when differentiating weighted average costs of capital across regions and technologies more accurately than usually done in the literature, we have immediate and substantial macroeconomic benefits from the transition. In the literature, we find a systematic overestimation of low carbon transition costs. And when pricing in increasing trust in use, these benefits get significantly larger. They are also outweighing possible negative macroeconomic effects from the risk of stranding of fossil based assets, because that, of course, happens at the same time. But here, uh, it really helps the transition in terms of profitability. In developed regions such as Europe, de risking renewables is an effective lever for reaching climate targets. And this, I think, indicates the relevance of green macro prudential uh, regulation such that um, companies um, are really given a framework to work with towards. Um, objectives in the long term sustainable interest um, and this reg regulation can come I think from both sides from the financial sector but of course also triggered by uh, policy. So here is some of the papers I mentioned uh, cited more fully but they are all also linked on the respective slides so on corona and climate that you know, I passed by only shortly, sectoral carbon budgets, and uh, the transitions in energy and industry, uh, which I used as an example, how frameworks and also macro modeling can uh, give insights to how to uh, frame that. Well, implementation, a final slide here, um, can go fast. In 1900, Easter Parade on the Fifth Avenue in New York. Um, where is the car? 13 years later, same place, same day, um, same occasion, where is the horse carriage? Of course, our transition now is more demanding because we normally need not only to transfer the transport sector, but all sectors together. But the know about speed of implementation also recently if you look at that picture just a few cell phones here around smartphones but um, eight years eight years later uh, we can build upon a very different structure of consumer technology here thanks a lot for your attention and happy to discuss in the last 10 minutes or longer however you um, you are available and how many questions you have um, on this applicability of the concepts also to um, direct exchange with industry and with policy at the national level. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. Um, I invite all the participants to uh, write their questions into the chat if they have questions actually. And, and I will just start with um, one question that refers to the first part of your presentation where you showed uh, the importance of tipping points or the possible emergence of tipping points due to physical risks. But I was made aware that you actually recently published a paper on socioeconomic tipping points. And so what could come to your, uh, one's mind is that in the case of very sudden and unanticipated changes in consumer preferences, we could see a tipping point in technology demand, and that could also then have quite a significant impact on the economic structure of our countries. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on these kind of social economics? Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion because the concept of tipping points originally came from the social sciences. It was used for the spatial development in cities where you had certain areas where uh, by race, uh, this segrega um, seg seg segregation, for example, you had a downward economic development and there was a tipping point there. And then the natural scientists took our tipping point concept and applied it to the geophysical concepts of, as, I, as my example was, on mel melting of ice, for example. But now, since about five, six years, it's coming back uh, to be used as a socioeconomic tipping point in the climate and environmental discussion as well. There was a PNS paper by Ilona Otto uh, earlier this year, and we had one um, from our Horizon 2020 project of defining what tipping points could there be because of climate. And Ilona Otto's paper was more on what tipping points can there be triggered by climate policy as well. But I think your question was on the climate-induced tipping points. And clearly, um, we do have um, various dangers, I would say, that this fire risk is, is one that I mentioned here that, that could lead to a socioeconomic tipping point when we really have a blackout, as we saw in California, also of uh, pre uh, cautionary cutoffs of the electricity then because they did not want to enhance the danger further. So really could have a significant impact and a completely different changing economic system, production system, which I think also gives incentives and clear direction where and how to develop our energy system in that particular case, how to adapt our production system in that case, a more decentralized energy production would help to avoid the most extreme damages from uh, blackouts. And in terms of technology tipping points, yes, uh, of course, we have these as well. And we need them also. Um, we are currently in, a, in another new project on tipping points for carbon intensive regions how we can foster those technological tipping points to really have pilot projects and how then they could uh, change the overall production system or start to change the whole overall production system in particular regions or even nationally. Um, may I can pick up here uh, because another question that arises is uh, you presented <coughs> the example of steel industry, and, and uh, of course we know that we need some technological changes in the, tech, uh, in the steel industry, but these changes or innovations are almost by definition very difficult to forecast. So in Austria, for example, in the political debate, we hear a lot nowadays about hydrogen and, and the importance of hydrogen technology for the future, but we know that particular technology, especially with respect to uh, mobility, is not available at the moment. And so my question is, uh, how do you actually then model this uh, when you have a, a forecasting period up to 2050? I mean, how do you imagine that these technologies will emerge? Yeah. The approach we did so easy to do so far was uh, stakeholder interaction and then work with uh, scenarios. What are the ranges that there might be? 
learning curves for technologies, but um, of course there may be this, this disruptive changes and um, so one can only work with uh, scenarios here. But there seems to emerge some uh, consents for hydro, hydro um, 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 no, Wasserstoff, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, that it's probably not the best technology for individual cars, but it may be definitely for industry and also for maybe a freight train, transport long this distance. So yeah, work, work, working, I think with uh, those scenarios is the only possibility we have. Um, and the second impact, of course, of economic research, how can we set the incentive structure right so that it's technology open, but still we know that also those technologies far off current profitability, far off markets readiness, still have the same chances of uh, getting a share if they might turn out true. But of course, that's a different modeling environment and you have dealt with that on, on, on the last day. So I see this macroeconomic approach that I showed today mainly for showing what could a new uh, situation look like and what are the interdependencies there. Okay, um, another question uh, with respect to the insurance effects and, and their impact on GDP. I mean, we know from some studies, even from other central banks, especially back in Italia, that uh, there are differences in insurance coverage among regions within countries, but also between countries, so that if there is a physical hazard that materializes, like the flooding, uh, there are huge differences among regions, how many households, how many countries have been insured. But on the other hand, I mean, this, this uh, being insured, of course, helps the individual household or the individual company very much. But on average or in, in, in equilibrium, basically, if, if uh, the number of, of uh, climate-related physical damages will increase, insurance premium will go up. So this could have a general equilibrium effect as well. Uh, could you elaborate how that uh, feeds into your models? Mm -hmm. Um, these are on two levels. Um, on the second, that um, if you have more of these extreme events, then uh, the, for example, in agriculture, you could either uh, switch uh, the crop or um, have to adapt by additional expenses. So we had, for example, spring frost in Austria for um, wine, vin for vineyards, and these additional costs show up. They are either insurance or physical investments of you know, hail nets, etc. Et so clearly, uh, in our model, in the model of the first half I showed, they show up as an increase in production costs. You have higher production costs, be it for insurance premium or be it for physical adaptation. Um, there is some adaptation possible, for example, if you invest early in other uh, fruits that are more heat resistant and more cold resistant, etc. Um, you might avoid some of these damages, but clearly uh, not all of them. So in our models, they mainly show up there. And for flooding, you're fully right. Uh, we have tremendous differences across Europe and glo glo globally as well. In Austria, for example, with our catastrophe fund, there is no incentive for the individual household, or a very minor incentive for the individual household to get insurance coverage because the catastrophe fund only pays if there is no insurance, private insurance before. So after the flood in 2002, yeah. it was, yeah. So, but, and the insurance in, industry tries for decades now to get compulsory uh, insurance also together with fire insurance or some other um, means you have to, you, you might take to do this risk diversification. So clearly, I think on both ends, there is a necessity to really rethink 
our insurance policy, but in that it, in both cases, in uh, in this insurance, will have an increase in cost. Yeah. So I have one final question. Uh, that because in, in the last slide you showed us that uh, the weighted average cost of capital are pretty, should be pretty different between different sectors and different industries based also on their technology. And so what, what we saw based on a survey that was conducted by the Environment Agency here in Austria is that, for example, <coughs> sorry, that our banks do not actually take into, uh, not many banks in Austria actually do not take into consideration climate risk when they, for example, calculate the interest rate on loan. So if banks and, and, and other investors would actually take these risks into consideration, then you would probably end up with that kind of differences in the weighted average cost of capital that you have been talking about. And I think that this, uh, making the financial sector more aware of these risks might be a way to uh, come with up to the solution. I mean, do you have any uh, research on that? Um, no, we are not doing research on that ourselves, but fully right, of course, this carbon bubble, actually, no, we do have some research on that. Yeah, this carbon bubble research, basically, that uh, stranded assets um, already are clear from the Paris Agreement how much carbon resources would need to remain underground. And I think you had it in earlier sessions that this is the direct impact, but the in indirect impact is, of course, for the industries depending on those uh, resources and working towards them, that um, it's very relevant on the project evaluation side, banks, credits, et cetera, to, to acknowledge these, but also on the national level. For example, there was a, a screening of the Austrian budget by the IMF, and it was the Austrian ministry, the finance ministry, that brought up this carbon bubble bar, bar, bar issue, and the IMF was not yet aware of that at all. That was done three or four, four years, years ago. I, at least those people here were not. So I think it's also really very relevant for the Austrian government. I mean, their whole um, dividends from the oil industry, for example, they are highly at risk whether they will flow in the future. So clearly, uh, this, um, and the question is who can change, change it? I mean, uh, BlackRock, for example, uh, asked, they announced two weeks ago, I think, a list in which com com companies they have a share and will uh, ask the managers, will not give uh, their agreement to the managers as they are not sufficiently fostering sustainable uh, ob objectives. So there's various channels I think uh, one can change and that's very crucial. Um, some stakeholders tell us even we don't need to do anything else just on the financial side. I don't agree to that but uh, definitely this would be a, a strong lever um, to ease this transition and to reduce the risk. Um, if I may just ask also a few questions. If, uh, the first was on risk absorption because um, we heard yesterday from Professor McKibben that uh, a carbon price would be uh, the most preferable option for economists typically and uh, you mentioned that uh, risk absorption for a coin based uh, should be another possibility. Um, do you think that, I mean, basically that the, the question amounts to should we have a whole range of measures rather than just uh, this, this carbon price? I mean, in both in terms of feasibility, but also in terms of uh, efficiency. No? Yeah. Um, I think the areas we are dealing with here, production and industry, household use of mobility devices are so different that we really need the whole spectrum of instruments for both for being cost effective but also and that's the second point you mentioned 
in terms of distributional in, in implications. We really need to be careful, not just which instrument we use, but also how, how, how we shape it. So CO2 pricing, clearly, yes, we can't. I mean, we can go without, but that would be tremendously more expensive for us. Um, but then also, if we in, introduce it, how to use the revenues is even more important, um, whether we use it for fostering also technological development for uh, coming for um, accommodating otherwise distributional uh, this um, implications that, that, that we dislike. Um, so we're currently working, for example, on how to fully get the transport sector to a carbon neutral path. And clearly, there's a whole list and a whole spectrum um, of instruments that are necessary to be used for implementability, we call it there, that the politicians really go ahead and also the, they also really benefit the population and, of course, effectiveness to really reach in time. And that's the balance, I think. We can introduce some instruments that are not radical enough and then don't lead uh, to, read, to read and reach in our targets. But at the same time, when they are radical enough, we have to still ensure the implementability. Let me ask you now a final question for the sake of uh, time. Um, you uh, realize, of course, that uh, there are various strategies in terms of carbon policies. There's one, for, one possibility is just to, to flag very ambitious targets and only then later on to fill them with concrete uh, implementation measures or to be to follow a more realistic path where you every time when you set a target you also uh, clearly set out the, the implementation measures i just ask you this because of course we know in the, in the austrian context we have now a very very ambitious target set as a uh, at um, carbon neutrality already in the year 2040, uh, even at the time when it was clear that the old 2050 target was uh, not even uh, filled uh, uh, with uh, sufficient uh, implementation methods. So, is it, I mean, this is of course a kind of philosophical question. Yeah? Should you start? Uh, where should you start? Is, 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 it, is it the egg or the, or the chicken? Yes. Yeah? So Mm -hmm. um, I think the relative merits of the two aspects uh, of the policy package are for this long-term target, that the example you mentioned of the Austrian government agreement, uh, carbon neutrality by 2040, which was actually a last-minute thing that only occurred this year in the first days of uh, January, when everything else was already settled. So that. I think the purpose for that, of that is mainly motivation atmosphere to really um, encourage to go that way. And the second, more important, even more important purpose, of course, is to really think from the final objective to the present, to really also in your immediate measures, don't do anything that um, hampers the long-term target. So, for example, this earlier question, uh, issue in Austria, make electricity carbon neutral immediately, may not be a wise idea, because for as long as we have gas for heating, we better use it in combined heat and power and still produce electricity at the same time from gas as well. So always have the long-term objective in mind to not go on blind or useless intermediate targets. That's the second issue. And beyond those two, of course, the immediate action is, is a relevant one. And stakeholders gave us feedback that Austria has lots of strategies and targets and so on. They are necessary for orientation, but if you don't go the second step, they don't help you at all. And the second step is you have other area of immediate uh, policy implementation. 
and in climate change, we have a tribal barrier. I mean, we need to start with the um, with the policy measures and, and and then adjust them again. There's no other means. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Okay. So thank you very much for this very uh, inspiring and insightful presentation, Professor Steininger. Uh, thank you all uh, for the participants for being with us. And I would uh, suggest that we now break and resume at 11 for the final panel discussion. So enjoy your coffee. And again, thank you very much, Professor Steininger. And thanks a lot for your questions and for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the to the final session to our panel um, with the title Monetary Policy and Climate Change, Theory and Practice Learning from the Current Crisis. Um, I welcome you all to the summer school also in general uh, and want to uh, so to, to use the opportunity to thank uh, Andreas uh, and Bert Bank uh, for the great organization you have uh, uh, done during the last uh, weeks and months. And uh, I think the output uh, this summer school uh, is really great. It's very interesting. Uh, I was uh, following uh, the presentations uh, at least a little bit. Uh, uh, so today, for instance, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Carl from Bart, uh, I think it was very interesting uh, from the Austrian point of view also to bring in these uh, um, uh, economic policy aspects. Now let's come to the panel, and the panel um, has, uh, I think it's very well chosen, the participants uh, for the panel, uh, Francesco Dudi from the ECB, uh, representing the uh, uh, I would say uh, the euro system uh, in general, but uh, also of course the ECB as an institution. Um, and open Francesco from the Monetary Policy Committee meetings. Uh, uh, we joined uh, many of them. He was on the side of the ECB, I was on the, on the Austrian deck. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Francesco, for joining us uh, today. Uh, I think I really. No introduction necessary uh, at this point. Uh, we know you quite well and your function at ECB. But I want to mention that you coordinate uh, uh, currently a work stream on monetary policy and climate change, which is part of the uh, strategic review of the ECB, of the strategy review. And I think, uh, or I guess, uh, it's uh, one of the most uh, interesting and, and uh, important. Uh, uh, work streams because when I listen to Madame Lazard, uh, I think uh, you're very much uh, in her focus uh, uh, on these days. Uh, then I welcome Pierre Francois Weber uh, from the Bank de France. He's representing the NDSS, which is, uh, I would say, key uh, in this respect. Uh, uh, he's Deputy Director of the Monetary Policy, Communication Director of the Bank of Laws, but I think uh, his uh, heart is uh, for the NGSS. Uh, and the NGSS is uh, uh, somehow uh, in, in the, in the uh, I have read one, uh, it's uh, a little bit um, the coalition of the willing, and I think this uh, coalition of the willing, this is really uh, uh, characterizing the NGFS uh, very well. Um, and uh, the NGFS has grown very fast, I would say so. Very seldom I have seen an institution growing so fast and increase. So obviously it's really uh, um, not only a very important issue that the NGFS is dealing uh, with, uh, it's also the engagement uh, of many, many institutions which becomes uh, bigger and bigger and, and make, make uh, the NGFS uh, a very important institution. Uh, by the way, Pierre Fosois has uh, some technical problems and I hope they can be solved in the meantime. Last but not least, I want to, to welcome Sandra, Sandra Fetchen from the Bank of England. Uh, she has already made a presentation on Tuesday, Tuesday uh, morning on climate change in the microeconomy, so you know Sandra uh, very well in the meantime. 
And uh, she's an economist and she published uh, also on this topic. So this is also the reason why she was invited. But uh, here I want to come with uh, a, a little bit of a story, uh, a personal one, um, uh, with this uh, Bank of England. Uh, and also why the Bank of England uh, has been cited. Uh, and uh, we all know that the uh, Bank of England uh, was one of the first ones who raised uh, uh, this topic. And I want to, to, to tell you that uh, Several years ago, uh, I was uh, invited to, to one of these uh, chief economist uh, workshops, uh, which is run uh, by the Bank of England uh, and always uh, takes place in May, Bank of England in London. And uh, uh, there is a, it's a meeting of uh, maybe 20, 25 people. And uh, there's always an introduction by Andy, by Andy Halsey. And uh, Andy always uses this uh, opportunity uh, to explain and to, um, to, to, to show the main topics uh, which are chosen by the Board of the Bank of England for next year, research topics. And a few years ago, one of these topics uh, was uh, climate change. And uh, I can tell you that uh, people present were quite surprised uh, and then raised a little bit the, uh, the eyebrow and then asked the uh, climate change and uh, central banks, uh, where, is, uh, uh, where is the link? Uh, why should we deal with climate change? And then decided to tell that uh, he sees uh, not only in general that uh, the topic for the future, uh, he sees that uh, it's a huge impact uh, mainly for financial stability and uh, he started to, to, to give this example uh, with the insurance companies uh, that insurance companies are more and more affected by uh, catastrophes uh, and uh, avalanches uh, and, and um, floods uh, and whatever and that uh, from this uh, side of the economy, it is a huge risk uh, to financial stability. Uh, and uh, from this side, uh, the whole finan all financial markets and therefore also central banks uh, in their supervisory uh, role, uh, but uh, last but not least, also in their monetary policy role, are will be highly affected. And I would say, uh, Andy was right. So uh, what we see now is that uh, this topic uh, has become a topic for all of us. Uh, it's one of the main topics uh, for central banks in the meantime, and uh, therefore we have time with some as well. So I do not want to keep you longer with uh, personal memories. I want to hand over um, to um, Francesco. Francesco will start with his presentation. Um, a few words to the organization of this panel. The fact that all three uh, presenters um, make some uh, introductory remarks, uh, also a little bit uh, speak about their organization, how they see their organization involved in the topic. Uh, only uh, 10 minutes each, maximum. And then we make three rounds of questions, uh, one on the Monday. Uh, one of the economy in general, and last but not least, the one on the crisis. And uh, this is the plan, and the plan is quite ambitious, I know, not only because of the time, but also we want to try to make uh, some active discussion. And yeah, let's try. So, yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, it's Francesco here. I hope you can. Uh, Hear me well. Uh, let me know otherwise. Uh, so th thanks a lot, uh, Doris, for the invitation, uh, which is uh, particularly stimulated at the current juncture in which we are working actively on uh, climate change uh, at the ECB. Uh, um, I prepared just a few slides. Uh, uh, with uh, your help, uh, we can go through them. Um, so, I will start uh, right away. If you can go to the second slide, uh, perhaps. Uh, yes, now here is a, 
I think uh, Doris summarized already well uh, what, what it is in this uh, slide. Uh, as uh, she said, that the Bank of England was quite uh, a pioneer in this uh, endeavor. Uh, the, 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 uh, the governor uh, was quite, uh, we know Mr. Carney was quite uh, effective in bringing this to the agenda of central banks. Uh, and now the Bank of England, of course, continue uh, in this endeavor. And then also, uh, as uh, uh, Doris mentioned, in, in GFS, on which uh, uh, Pierre-Francois will speak, and of course, Sandra on the first topic, uh, was very important to spread the, the, the awareness of, of the issue across central bank and uh, started to provide the public uh, uh, messages. So, and that was, uh, if you, I, I would say that uh, this started mainly from financial stability, <coughs> I'm sorry, and then moved gradually to uh, banking supervision issues, and there was a, a increasing debate uh, on the matter in various uh, fora, and uh, we'll see what this will bring. Uh, and then more recently, I would say that uh, started to affect uh, also the discussion of what a central bank can do. Uh, given that the central bank, especially at present, uh, play a very important uh, role uh, in, uh, in, in um, the economy, not only via interest rate policies, which of course would be less uh, easy uh, to, to, to use for a climate change purpose, but also to other uh, operation which uh, in, the, in the public debate uh, could uh, uh, be uh, if you like, fine-tune to take care uh, of uh, uh, climate change issues. And uh, if you like, i like to go to slide uh, four, to skip one, and uh, to which I will come back. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, no, no, sorry, slide three. Uh, slide three is, uh, if you go back one, uh, I, I was, uh, now, this, uh, in, in the, uh, here you can see there are many things that uh, are done, which are done primarily of of course, by other actors on the in the in uh, other policy actors, uh, uh, which relate to, uh, for example, fiscal, industrial, other government policies, and uh, I don't go through the various uh, uh, issue that uh, can be dealt uh, uh, by public policies. Uh, of course, the ECB uh, role, also general role, is to uh, take part in the debate and uh, uh, inform the public about where we stand. And uh, we can also provide an example. For example, uh, uh, at the ECB, uh, the, the, and here I'm talking really about a bit of the ECB in a narrow sense, uh, is uh, the, the, our non-monetary portfolio, our pension fund portfolio. We can think how to uh, um, uh, to publish uh, our um, footprint that we can have and so on. Uh, so as I say, the ECB, because this is more uh, not a Euro system uh, wide uh, task sometime when we talk about uh, the own financial portfolio, even though we know there are uh, active discussion on how to harmonize the, uh, the, the, the policies uh, for what concern the non-monetary policy portfolio. Then, of course, then uh, the next step is financial policy supervision. Of course, this the ECB is very much uh, uh, involved, uh, not much for the, 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 the monetary policy implication, but for the implication for uh, financial stability and uh, microprudential micro supervision. And uh, um, there are many act, uh, actions the ECB will, could take and will take, and, uh, but I will, will not dwell with this uh, uh, in my presentation, uh, uh, and, and I'd rather focus on, uh, on monetary policy. Now, the, the third block, monetary policy, of course, uh, the question is, uh, the, the, the key question is how to integrate uh, monetary policy, uh, sorry, climate change consideration in uh, uh, the tools uh, that are used by the Euro system uh, um, to, uh, to, to shape uh, monetary policy. We have the, the, the implication for the preparation of macroeconomic models, I will go to that, that is quite a, a challenge, but there could be uh, more uh, implication also for the 
a composition of a central bank uh, asset portfolio. I'm talking here about the monetary, po uh, monetary policy portfolio for the collateral uh, framework and the risk management related uh, to these portfolios. But uh, it could touch also more in general um, a monetary policy uh, operation of various type, as I will uh, say later. If we go now to uh, we skip the next one. We go to the second slide uh, on the on the macroeconomic uh, on the macro macroeconomy. So the, if you go to the next, please, Andreas. Yes. No, just uh, logically, I think it's better. Now it is clear that uh, central bank uh, they have uh, to uh, take into account climate change uh, in their modeling. Uh, we need to incorporate this. Uh, and we need to take into account uh, also in uh, our uh, models uh, the macroeconomic impact of transition and mitigation policies. Uh, I would say also uh, building on a recent discussion we are having within the euro system, uh, there are a number of areas on which it will be uh, very, uh, very important to make uh, swift progress. Uh, um, for example, when I, in, the, in the section uh, which uh, I will label ongoing project, uh, the, um, we have to take into account uh, in, in, in the model the impact of climate change on inflation, long-term growth and trade. Uh, and this uh, um, applies uh, not only uh, on long-term growth, of course, uh, is clear, uh, it's challenging, but clear. But uh, we, we need also to have an idea of uh, the the size of the shock and uh, how they could uh, disrupt the economy. And this needs uh, a lot of uh, uh, reflection of uh, uh, what uh, uh, this may bring. By the way, uh, as uh, Doris said, I think there, there is already here a clear link to COVID because the physical risk is something very clear, similar to the COVID. And then uh, for the future, we'll have uh, perhaps some further reflection for possible uh, reaction to physical uh, shock uh, that, um, uh, to, to, from physical uh, materialization of physical risk uh, related to climate change, uh, uh, having in mind what uh, we are doing now. Uh, then, of course, the, 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 the role of uh, uh, fiscal policies uh, to, to address climate change, uh, the implication for the macroeconomy is important. So the, then the challenges, of course, is uh, to integrate this in macro modeling uh, and uh, how to translate uh, uh, this into um, the implication for the projection and our uh, risk uh, assessment. For those that are uh, familiar with the Euro system structure, uh, this is an endeavor that uh, involves not only the MPC, uh, uh, but also the other uh, committees of the MPC namely the, the, the working group of uh, fiscal policies, because it's a, it's a fiscal matter, the working group on uh, economic modeling, and the working um, group on uh, the, the, the projection. Um, uh, so if we go now back to the previous slide, uh, and this, uh, this is the last slide I would like to present uh, as an introduction, which is a bit the uh, the core of the of the question posed by uh, uh, by Doris, uh, uh, they are the, 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 what, which could be the concrete implication for monetary policy going forward. So there is a part which is of course not challenge, which uh, we need to start understanding uh, uh, better the, 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 in, a, in a quantitative way, if you like. The possible implication uh, of climate change, for example, for the natural rate. Of course, this link to what we find in, my, in our modeling is very challenging, but we should start thinking uh, whether this has a, a, a clear implication or already now. We can provide example who point in that direction, uh, but uh, the, the, there is a lot of work on that. The second is uh, to have uh, some idea about the, whether the transition policies could uh, um, provide shock or even trend in some of the uh, key variables. I, I think about uh, inflation, which may need uh, maybe post-challenge to monetary policy. 
and then in general uh, to have an idea of uh, the, the size of the shock uh, and the, as i said this for example the, the covid experience could be useful just to have an idea of the risk that uh, uh, we may be facing and the pos possible reaction uh, so then uh, and this is no challenge the second uh, point is that uh, whether the ecb should just uh, uh, focus uh, uh, on the uh, risk, uh, on the risk implication of, uh, uh, of climate change, which uh, risk, which can may lead to the uh, uh, um, uh, to, to the for the asset portfolio we have and the for lateral we we uh, hold throughout the euro system, uh, in a way which is not sufficiently uh, recognized by financial market participants and uh, credit. Uh, and, and uh, credit risk agency and this is a completely uh, unchallenged uh, if you like uh, uh, task that we have to face uh, and uh, on, which is not easy but it's not easy at the same time because it's not easy to understand when how to which extent the risk uh, uh, climate uh, related risk are already included and we need the good evidence to deviate uh, for what is the uh, what is provided to us by market prices and the credit uh, risk agency assessment <coughs> the the issue which is more challenging and which is less uh, of course uh, on which the, there is a debate the true debate if you like is the uh, whether the ecb and the euro system uh, in, uh, should address proactively the the green transition we will return this also in the context uh, of the mandate. So the question is whether the ECB is permitted or even obliged to address environmental uh, protection objective with a particular focus on uh, climate change. And uh, on this, I would like uh, to return um, in the second round. Now, what are we doing now? Uh, it's uh, we have this uh, climate change is one of the team of the ECB monetary policy strategy. You know that uh, the president, a number of uh, uh, members, a number of governors are very eager to, uh, to see this debate, the debate of this debate. We have uh, this MPC work stream, on which also Andreas uh, uh, is part, on climate change and monetary policy. Uh, and we'd like to uh, assess uh, all the implications for the conduct of a monetary policy in coordination with uh, the market operation committee and this management committee, because uh, of course they are very much essential, and coordinate work with, uh, within the euro system. I, I have to say that uh, um, Pierre Francois will may focus on NGFS, uh, but uh, he's one of the chair of this work stream. <coughs> I'm sorry of this work stream and uh, we the, we plan to have a, a discussion at the governing council at the beginning of next of next year in february i this is very important because this will be an occasion to discuss uh, uh, at the governing council level all the dimension that i said including the possible proactive role i don't want to uh, uh, Prejudge what the discussion will uh, will be. I will return this in the second part. But I think for the communication of the euro system, it will be uh, crucial. Uh, this discussion will have uh, in uh, in February, and then in the public communication on the strategy later on. To um, if you like, uh, make a bit the point of what uh, we we will be we are doing already in in various ways, and we may be uh, willing to do. Uh, in the in the future in the context of monetary policy. I think uh, I, it's better I stop here and uh, I will return on a couple of issues in the second round. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, last but not least, I want to thank my colleague uh, Gianluigi, who is also a member of this uh, work stream to, uh, in the preparation of this slide. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I also want to advertise uh, in this respect, uh, a document which I read uh, in the last uh, days uh, is on climate change and monetary policy initial takeaways. Uh, it was released in June 2020 and it's a very 
very interesting document and in addition to the long list of literature uh, recommendations on the issue so I really uh, also want to, to recommend uh, to read uh, the reading. So last but not least uh, we come to Sandra. Sandra are you with us? I'm afraid that you are also um, I am only on phone, no picture from you, which is a TT, but you also have a PowerPoint with you and uh, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry about the lack of um, video connection. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. It's a real pleasure to share um, this panel with uh, such prestigious institutions and, and speakers. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the activities of the, uh, the Bank of England on climate change. However, please um, notice that if I express any views on emerging issues, um, this only represents my personal views and should not be taken um, as representing those of the Bank of England sector in March this year. Um, and also, the government set out its intention to include climate change in the remit of the Prudential Regulation Committee in the next remit letter. So in the FPC remit letter, the Chancellor set out the committee's role in protecting and enhancing the resilience of the financial sector to climate risk. More specifically, the remit letter notes that the FPC has a role in protecting and enhancing the resilience of the financial sector to climate risk. And also the government green finance strategy states that similar consideration will be included in the PRA next remit letter. So the main role of the bank is to build resilience to the risk from climate change into the financial system, proactively managing climate risks and reducing them before they have a chance to crystallize. But how did we get here? So as, uh, Many um, already mentioned the Bank of England was the pioneer among central banks in the assessment of the climate risk for central bank. Um, so if you could please show uh, slide four. Um, I also have um, a timeline um, which highlights some of the main activities of the bank over the past five years. Um, so. The, the most notable um, event that started was Mark Carney's speech, um, the famous speech, The Tragedy of the Horizon. But what may, may, maybe people don't, are not aware of is that at the same time, um, well, well, actually months before that, um, there was a team working with the insurance, com insurance companies and the insurance sector uh, to try and understand the impact of climate change in the UK insurance sector, which also which culminated in a report published in September, also the same year. And, and around mid um, 2015, a small team of researchers, of which I was uh, like, lucky to, to be part of, started a research project on uh, climate change and central bank objectives. Um, Ever since the bank has been a very active, uh, in particular in, on an international um, initiative, he was one of the funding members of the uh, Network for Green in the Financial System in December 2017. But he also worked um, very hard to support the work of the um, Task Force for um, Financial Disclosure, Climate Financial Disclosure. It has in, um, created more recently created two domestic fora, the Climate Risk Financial Forum and the Sustainable Insurance Forum. Um, also, um, um, in 2018, the bank published uh, a report on the impact of climate change on the banking sector, so mirroring the, the one of the insurance sector a few years um, earlier. Uh, finally, in its financial stability report in uh, mid 2019, the bank announced its plan to run a climate strategy 
of financial funds. This was initially scheduled to take place or to be launched in 2020. However, due to the pandemic, is now um, being postponed. Launch uh, is being postponed to 2021. The way the the bank uh, work on climate change um, is carried out uh, is, is based on a hub and spoke model. So there is a central climate hub, which is uh, located within the Prudential Regulation Authority, and then there are spokes in each of the most of bank directorates, so small um, teams, uh, often um, based on a ad hoc project basis. Um, the next slide, uh, slide five, uh, looks a bit more specifically at the micro level initiatives um, uh, of the bank. So the bank has um, for a long time supported a consistent, comparable, and comprehensive climate disclosure, and it is part now of the government led passport on climate dispo disclosure. The PRA and the um, Financial Conduct Authority also is established and co chair the Climate, Climate Financial Risk Forum in March um, 2019. In April 2019, the bank published a document stating the supervisory expectations of firms' approach to managing the financial risk from climate change, covering governance, risk management, scenario analysis, and disclosure. And this was followed by um, a CEO letter on the 1st of July this year with further guidance to industry. In June 2020, the bank also published its very first um, uh, climate disclosure report. Um, this set out the approach for, to managing the risk from climate change across its entire operation and the steps taken to improve the bank's understanding of this risk. This report follows the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Framework, which is structured around four core elements governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. In terms of governance, governance the governance of climate related financial risk is now including within the bank's governance structure. Uh, the, bank, the bank's climate strategy is focused on understanding and mitigating the financial risk from climate change which directly impacts both its outward-facing policy limit and its own operations. In terms of risk management, matrix, and targets, the bank actively monitors its own exposures to climate change and how that exposure could impact the regime of its operations. The process of managing this risk is now established, but we'll continue to develop um, as new data methodology and uh, understanding of the risks evolve. So this um, risk management includes the bank's financial asset portfolio, which are held in the Bank of England Asset Purchase Facility Fund. And finally, uh, on slide six, um, I have listed some of the top-down initiatives. So at the end of last year, um, um, we published a discussion paper um, that set out the, um, the intention uh, to stress test the resilience of the UK's largest bank, insurance, and the financial system uh, to different climate pathways. And also, we plan to publish a roadmap on how we will engage um, with firms um, uh, on the, along the way of, up to the launch of the stress test. The plan is to uh, run the test of under three scenarios, um, one uh, without additional policy action, um, where um, the current emission path continues and warming to three degrees above pre industrial levels. A second uh, scenario uh, where policy action starts uh, early, so uh, achieve a uh, net zero target in an orderly fashion by 2050. And uh, the first scenario, um, where policy is uh, implemented late, so the transition to net zero is um, happening in a disorderly fashion. To conclude, um, the main initiatives um, at the Bank of England 
uh, around climate change are focused on financial stability, um, both on the macroprudential side and on the microprudential side. As far as monetary policy is concerned, it's early days, um, and we are at the moment involved uh, in the analysis and debates uh, at international level, in particular within uh, the network for greening the financial system. Um, so th this network published earlier in summer a number of reference scenarios, as well as a guide for central banks and supervisors. Um, and which we also um, took part and contributed to. So this is uh, it for me um, for the moment. Okay. Thank you very much, Sandro, for this uh, introduction. I think it's quite impressive what the Bank of England did so far, and also the future plans uh, are uh, promising. For instance, this climate stress test, uh, I think, is really very interesting, and it's a pity that it has to be postponed uh, because of COVID. Uh, let me now come to our first round of, of discussion, and as uh, Francesco has mentioned already in his intervention, but also Sandra did. Uh, there is this question of uh, mandates. Uh, and the question is, uh, which I would like to raise, uh, is this uh, dealing with uh, climate change and focusing on climate change and trying to, to, to reorient instruments uh, and policy to take this issue on, into account uh, uh, Part or covered by uh, our mandate, by the mandate of central banks. We all know that mandates are different. Uh, uh, in some central banks, they are much more focused on price stability. Solidly, sometimes even in other central banks, uh, they are broader, uh, have uh, another target, uh, very often financial stability is in the forefront, or price stability. Uh, there is uh, some other uh, um, target, uh, like for instance, uh, low unemployment rate, uh, so I target on, on, on labor market. So Francesco, what do you think? Uh, is it covered by the mandate of the euro system of the ECB, or do you see a conflict here? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, no, just uh, let me say a couple of words. Uh, perhaps in the meantime, Andreas could also put uh, on slide seven um, of the, the presentation. No, the, the, the couple of words that uh, uh, I, I wanted to start to say while uh, putting in the slide of money is the following, is that there are a number of uh, actions that uh, uh, are fully in line with the price stability uh, objective. Uh, this is what I, when I spoke about, uh, especially, uh, okay, the modeling, we, we know, is, uh, of course, uh, is just obvious, but also when it comes to uh, risk management uh, uh, practices or uh, uh, regulation, which uh, may uh, favor, um, uh, which may have a climate change uh, supportive uh, flavor, these are fully in line with preservation. What I mean is that, for example, initiative to disclosure, uh, to support disclosure uh, of emission uh, to the extent they are related uh, to risk, this is fully in line with the price stability uh, mandate. And uh, even uh, to come to some standard of disclosure for eligibility is fully in line with the uh, price stability mandate. Uh, or initiative then uh, to have the collateral framework taking in account uh, uh, climate change risk or risk management for the asset portfolio and take into account climate change risk are fully in line with the price stability objective. Having said that, they are difficult because uh, you need to have uh, objective criteria in order uh, to uh, change the uh, composition of your portfolio and, uh, um, in, um, in, um, establish rule for the collateral, and this will take time. Uh, so there, there are uh, committees working in, uh, on it, uh, but it will take time, but this is a, an avenue. Then there is, a, as a Doug has mentioned, 
there is a bit in a mandate issue for what concern uh, uh, green policies supported by monetary policy. And uh, um, uh, to the extent they are not strictly needed to support price stability. So then here, what uh, I put in this slide is uh, what we know is that the, the, the ECB in the treaty, uh, uh, um, the ESCB, that now we, we should read the Euro system, uh, shall support the general economic policies of the Union. And, uh, and then uh, uh, when you look at the treaty on the European uh, Union, it says uh, the one of the um, these policies relate uh, the protection of an improvement of the quality of the environment. So, uh, the, the, so the, there is a case to go in this direction. Um, uh, the, the, there are some preconditions which need to be satisfied and uh, uh, to go in this direction. This article, we put also on the slide article 11, which seems to suggest the uh, ECB as other uh, EU institutions are obliged to do something, but this is all, has always been interpreted in a vague sense. So uh, um, it, it should not be, the, it does not dictate anything uh, to the uh, Euro system in terms of action. Uh, so let me focus then in the, on, the, on this so called secondary objective. In any case, uh, whatever it is taken, it should not prejudice price stability. Uh, it is true that the, the treaty is written in a way which is sufficiently vague. There is no a hierarchy, so it, it could be the case that uh, the, the Euro system select climate change as one of these tasks, as this uh, 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 economic policy to support and not other, because it could be more macroeconomically relevant. It should not extend uh, ECB competences, uh, and this is a very difficult uh, uh, issue. And uh, it should, in gen the, 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 the belief uh, is that it should act in accordance with open market economy, which is also in the treaty. The open market uh, economy so far has been interpreted as if the ECB should be neutral uh, in its purchases, which is very difficult. The, the, the jurisprudence says, seems to suggest that neutral means is uh, what it is in the market, but it's uh, never been uh, there was never uh, any ruling uh, uh, on, on this uh, on, on this particular issue because uh, then somebody argues that there is a market failure. So if we look at the market portfolio, is not uh, uh, the right way to uh, to, to act in in, um, in line with the open market. So if you like, the, the, the bottom line is that it is possible. It has to be well justified um, uh, because. In, in order to support uh, climate change policy, the ECB should change the composition of this uh, portfolio. The question is, is this justified uh, uh, in any way so that is, uh, we should have, uh, um, we should also respect the so-called pr principle of proportionality, which uh, we know that is, uh, was quite prominent in recent uh, discussion, legal discussion. It means is that uh, as the ECB, the means uh, to uh, be effective in its action to support uh, uh, climate change mitigation policies, or uh, and then is this the best way in which uh, this objective could be achieved? So is the ECB uh, the be best equipped to achieve this, uh, this objective? And then here, of course, is a quite uh, uh, an interesting debate, uh, which has to touch uh, a number of things, including the possible defectiveness of the instrument. We will return uh, in the next uh, round, I understand, and uh, uh, whether it, it is the one that it should, uh, the ECB should, should be entitled uh, to do this. Having said that, in any case, what is clear, and that is the, the, the opinion of, uh, I would say, lawyer and economists, is that uh, the action of the ECB should be, uh, the ECB in the, the Euro system in general should be just uh, um, not the primary uh, set of action, but should support the action which are conducted primarily, uh, primarily at the level uh, of uh, um, uh, other EU institution or the national level in a coordinated way uh, uh, according to 
EU rules. So I would uh, stop here uh, for this topic. Thanks. Okay.